We're in this uh, sermon, or this series on God giving and gifts, and uh, so far a brief overview. Uh, we started with God. We started with the fact that God wants you before he wants your money. God wants you before he wants your money. Uh, he can, if you can give God your money without giving him yourself, he wants you. Not just your money, but it's pretty hard to give God yourself and not also give him your money. And by the way, it's not your money. It's not our money. It's God's money. It's what God allows us to have and to use. And so we should want to know, want to know how he says to use it. And then we looked at declarations about money. We looked at Jesus' command to lay up treasures in heaven and not on earth. And, and last week and now today, we're again looking at why we should give money. Why should we give money? Uh, we should have Bible reasons for believing what we believe, but we should also have Bible reasons for doing what we do. I'm taking a time out for a commercial right now because I know Deanna's not sitting there. Um, we're short of some ladies today, okay? Abby and my wife, and so there's some extra hands that could be used during the meal time, okay? So I'm putting that commercial out there. Those online don't feel obligated to come up at this time. We understand that. But um, just wanted to throw that out there. Well, uh, I, I know we're a little short-handed in that regard. So last week we looked at some principles from the Old Testament. And uh, they were principles because not commands. Uh, it's important that we differentiate uh, commands for the nation of Israel were for the nation of Israel. We did not replace, the church did not replace Israel. Uh, we did not take their place. We don't believe in replacement. Okay, ladies, you don't have to all leave. No. <laughs> the, the church did not replace Israel. We do not believe in replacement theology. There is a future for Israel and a very uh, predominant future for Israel as a nation uh, here on earth. But so we look at the Old Testament and there are commands to the Jews, but underneath those commands there are principles that still apply to us. And here's some that we looked at last week. First, just as giving to the tabernacle or the temple was a way to give to God, they gave to God by bringing money to the tabernacle and the temple. Uh, that same is true now. You can give to God. You can't leave your money in a field somewhere for God to come and get. You bring, you give gifts to God a way, not the only way, is through the church. Second, bringing offerings to the tabernacle and the temple in the Old Testament was a way to worship God. There was an attitude of gratitude. There was an attitude of thanksgiving. And part of that meant bringing offerings to the church. Uh, we need to look at it the same way. Putting money in the offering plate should not be paying a bill because I have to. It should be, I want to do this in a, an expression of thanks for what God has done for me. And then third, uh, just as bringing offering to the tabernacle or temple was a way to build or maintain the building, same thing holds true uh, here. Monies are needed to keep our uh, lights on and uh, uh, furnace going in the winter and our little AC unit and maintenance of the building, all those kind of things. And so this morning, and uh, it's interesting how um, the songs, I pick the songs early in the week, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then sometimes the sermon kind of takes a detour from the songs and so if you're really astute and you're like wow the song pastor the songs didn't really mess you know probably don and brenda are the only ones who pay attention to what uh, the music but you're, but uh they're like wow that, that was kind of a disconnect there yeah well that happens sometimes so anyway uh we're going to look at two more reasons we're going to start off with again a principle from the old testament not commands but principles and then we're going to look at some teaching in the new testament and we're actually going to see how God led Paul to take an Old Testament principle and apply it to the church. And so, obviously, there's a Bible precedence for doing that. So, number one on your outline, number one, 
Uh, bringing offerings to God's house was God's way to take care of his servants. Bringing offerings to God's house was God's way to take care of his servants. Uh, this obviously could be a sermon in of itself. Uh, I have God's house in quotes. Only because we understand, you know, we call this the house of God sometimes. We call it a church. Uh, but we do understand that no building can contain God. God is not confined to a house. Uh, God is greater than can be confined in a physical structure. And God is everywhere present. But generally speaking, uh, the people of Israel, the Old Testament nation, had a place where they met to worship God. It would start off a tabernacle, a tent that was put up and taken down and moved and so on. And then there was also later uh, the temple. We now have a building, but not everyone has buildings. There were places of worship since the time of Christ. Uh, sometimes they were just a house. You know that, right? The early church met in houses, but they were set, they're, they're oftentimes uh, bringing to a particular place, I'm calling it God's house. So hopefully you got that. Take your Bibles. I'm going to have you moving around a little bit. Uh, take your Bibles, you already know from your outline, to Numbers chapter 18. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. If you're using a pew Bible, it's page 127. 127, Numbers 18. Yeah, I was teasing the, the folks here in Sunday school. I said, that it's a good thing you came to Sunday school today because you got the preaching, and Sunday school is actually going to be in the morning service. Uh, we're, we're, it's going to be more of a Bible study format, but my, uh, my job is to, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, uh, so not only do we have different people, but we have people in different stages of their Christian life. And so there's some things that some of you have known for 30 years, and some things are brand new to other people. And so uh, this is a, a teaching time on why we're putting money in the offering plate. Uh, letter A, letter A, those that served in the tabernacle were taken care of by offerings. Those that served in the tabernacle, the tent, were taken care of by offerings. Numbers 18, in the way of background, God's people had left Egypt under the leadership of Moses. Moses is the primary leader, but God has ordained Moses' brother, Aaron, as kind of the spiritual leader leader, the religious leader, if I can use that, that word. And so Aaron and his sons were to work in the tabernacle, and then God, so Aaron and the sons were to be the priests, but then there was another tribe, the Levites, which actually Aaron was from, uh, the Levites were supposed to help them. Uh, the tent was huge, and it had to be taken down and put up, and so there were certain responsibilities that the priests had certain responsibilities that the Levites had. Verse number 1, so Numbers 18, verse number 1, we see that God is speaking to Aaron. Uh, God, the instructions start with verse 8, but I want to look at verse number 9. Numbers 18, verse number 9. And God, again, is talking to Aaron, and he says to Aaron, This shall be thine of the most holy things reserved from the fire. Every oblation of theirs, every meat offering of theirs, and every sin offering of theirs, and every trespassing offering of theirs, which they shall render unto me, shall be most holy for thee and for thy sons. We aren't going to turn back to Leviticus and try and look at all these uh, offerings and what was this offering and what was that offering, but hopefully you got from my emphasis that God is saying to Aaron, what they bring of theirs and offer to me, they become yours. They shall be most holy for thee and thy sons. What were they to do with it? Verse number 10, in the most holy place shall thou eat of it. The offering, you were supposed to, Aaron and his family lived off the offerings that were brought to the tabernacle. Verse number 11, And this is thine, the heave, off, the heave offering of their gift, 
with all the wave offerings I have given, given them unto thee and to thy sons and to thy daughters. Uh, verse number 12, all the best of the oil and the best of the wine and the best of the wheat and the first fruits of them which they offer unto the Lord, them have I given thee. Whatsoever is first ripe in the land, verse 13. These instructions continue through verse number 20. And now let's, we're going to skip some of that. Let's look at verse number 21, because God not only took care of the priests, he also took care of the Levites. Look at verse number 21. And behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tenth in Israel for an inheritance, for their service which they serve, even the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. So the nation, that, that uh, tenth that's being talked about, the nation was supposed to bring 10% of whatever they had. It was gathered up at the tabernacle. Uh, some of it was given to the Levites. That's what it says. Verse number, uh, jumping ahead, verse number 24. Well, let's, um, yeah, verse number 24. But the tithes of the children of Israel, which they offer as a heave offering unto the Lord, I've given them, I've given to the Levites. And then they, in turn, verse 26, speak unto the Levites, when they get the tithes, which I have given you from them, then they shall offer a tenth part. And verse 28 says that that part shall be given unto Aaron. So here's the picture. Offerings of different animals are sacrificed. The offerings are brought. They're sacrificed. Aaron and his family eats from that. Monies, other things come in to the tabernacle. The Levites, the other helpers, are to get that. They, in turn, were to give some to Aaron. But the point, again, hopefully I'm not being overly redundant, is that the people who God set aside to work in the tabernacle, to serve God in the tabernacle, were provided for by the people. That was God's principle in the Old Testament. So, did that continue? That was true under Moses' time. Did the practice continue? Again, I told you, this Bible study, almost Sunday school time, only you don't get to interrupt me in the middle and ask questions, okay? Um, and I'm not going to stop in the middle and ask, ask for questions, but did the people continue this? Well, fast forward 500 years. Moses is replaced by Joshua, eventually replaced by Judges, eventually replaced by the first king of Israel, uh, Saul, and then David, and then Solomon. David wanted to build a, a temple. He could not. Solomon did. Solomon built the temple in 960 B.C. So we have the tabernacle in the early times when they're wandering through the wilderness. We later have the temple. Now take your Bibles and turn to 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles. If you're using a pew Bible, it's page 373. Uh, from where you are now, keep going towards the back of the Bible. If you get to Psalms, you went too far. If you have to use your table of contents, that's fine. I, I want you to, to find it. 2 Chronicles chapter 31. So again, here's the picture. Hezekiah is now king. Hezekiah is king. Uh, Solomon built the temple in 960. The kingdom split between the northern and southern kingdom in 930. The northern kingdom is carted away to Assyria in 722. And now it's 700 years later, 500 BC or so, and Hezekiah is the king. Hezekiah is the king. There is a temple. And look at verse number 4. So we know from verse 2 that Hezekiah is the one being referred to. 2 Chronicles, how are we doing? Everybody there? 2 Chronicles 31, verse 4. Moreover, he, Hezekiah, commanded the people that dwelt in Jerusalem to give the portion of the priests and the Levites that they might be encouraged in the law of the Lord. It seems that there was a lapse 
of providing for them. And Hezekiah said, we need to start doing this again. And said to those in Jerusalem, start doing that. In verse number 5, we see that they obeyed. As soon as the commandment came abroad, the children of Israel brought in the abundance of the first fruits of the corn, the wine, the oil, and the honey, all the increase, the tithe of all those things. And so they started bringing it in like they were supposed to. Uh, verse number 6 then it says the children of Israel. So not only were people in Jerusalem doing it, now word spread around that, oh, these people in the other cities, they started bringing in the stuff. And they started bringing in the stuff. And they brought in the stuff, and they collect, verse 7 says, uh, they started to have too much stuff. And they made heaps. And they gathered what should have been coming in gradually. They gathered all in the span of three months, uh, started the third month, end the seventh month. Uh, verse 8, Hezekiah and some of the princes, they go and check out what's happening at the temple, and they see these heaps. In verse number 9, Hezekiah questioned with the priests and Levites concerning the heaps. Verse 10, and Azariah, the chief priest of the house of Zadok, answered him and said, Since the people began to bring the offerings into the house of the Lord, we have had enough to eat and have left plenty. For the Lord hath blessed his people, and that which is left is a great store. And so here it is again, the tabernacle when Moses was in charge, years later, 700 years later, uh, now underneath a king that has the temple, again, they are bringing in the offerings to take care of those that worked in the temple. So that's the Old Testament. And that's commandments to the nation of Israel. What about now? What about the New Testament? Turn now to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, that's in the New Testament. So way, way towards the back of your Bible. Pew Bible, it's page 845. 845. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. What does the New Testament have to say about taking care of those who serve God? Letter C. Those that preach and teach God's word are to be taken care of by the church. It's being pretty straightforward, isn't it? Those that preach and teach God's word are to be taken care of by the church. We're going to start with verse 6. Paul asks a question. Or I only, and Barnabas, have not we power to forbear working? Here's what he's saying. Power is authority or the right. And he's saying, all these other guys stopped working because you're supporting them. Are Barnabas and I the only ones who have to keep working? Are we the only ones that have to are, are going to refrain from stopping working? Verse number 7. Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Paul reminds them a soldier gets paid. He doesn't go to battle on his own. People who plant a vineyard get to enjoy the fruit of the vineyard. People who take care of flocks enjoy the milk and probably the meat of the flock. So he's reminding them that people that do certain things get to reap from those things. And then he says in verse 8, Say I these things as a man. Is this, is this just my human reasoning? Is this just my opinion? Uh, or saith not the law the same thing? Didn't Moses in the Old Testament talk about this? Then verse 9, For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Interesting. Paul's talking about taking care of the servants of God, and he says, hey, doesn't the Bible say in the Old Testament that oxen, you're not supposed to muzzle their mouth, uh, they get to actually eat on the job. They're treading out the corn. Let them enjoy the corn as they're treading out the corn. I'm not sure what happens with the dropping, but we'll, we'll move on. Um, 
but anyway, uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure what that what that picture looked like. But uh, so Paul, and then Paul asks the question: Doesn't the law say it? And then, it, and then in the end of verse nine, he says, "Doth God take care for oxen? Is God only concerned about oxen?" Then he answers his own question. Or verse ten, saith he it altogether for our sakes. For our sakes, no doubt, this is written. Paul takes an Old Testament commandment and reminds the people it's not just about the oxen. It's about people. And it's about the people that serve God and they, just as the oxen gets to enjoy the fruit of his labors, God's servants should enjoy the fruit of their labors. Verse 10 uh, talks about those that plow and hope and those that thresh. Uh, those that, you know, Gary does a lot of planting. Number you do plant gardens. You don't plant gardens just for the exercise. You plant gardens for the hope and the prospect of getting some produce from that. And that's what Paul says. Uh, when you plow, you plow in hope. You plow, you, you're doing it because you expect a harvest. Uh, same thing when you thresh. And then verse number 11, Paul brings it back to himself as a servant of God. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we reap your carnal things? Carnal, a lot of times in the Bible, has a negative connotation. Uh, it doesn't here. It's just fleshly things. It's material things. Paul's painting a contrast. He says, if I am helping you in spiritual things, is it wrong for me to expect to be taken care of in physical things? In verse 12, Paul says, if others do this, uh, why can't we? And then he says, we have not done that. But look at verse number 13. Pretty straightforward. Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? I just went through all that, right? Tabernacle and temple. Paul says, don't you know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? Hey, they sacrifice these animals, they get some of the meat. Verse number 14. Even so, hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Pretty straightforward. Money comes to the church to take care of the pastor. Some of you might be thinking, wow, pastor, aren't you being kind of self-serving? No, I'm teaching you what the Bible says, and what you decide to do with it is up to you. But I'm teaching what the Bible says. And, you know, I started this with, before, a couple weeks ago. Maybe you don't know why we give money. Well, I'm going through the Bible and giving you those reasons. There's uh, a couple other places that we're not going to turn to, but I do want to remind you of this. Jesus sends out the 70, right? He sent out the 12, but he sends out 70. He sends them out two by two, and he tells them they're going to go to the cities and they're going to, where Jesus is going to come. And so they're preparing the way. Hey, Jesus is going to be coming to the city. And Jesus instructed them, don't take a backpack full of food. Don't take a whole bunch of stuff with you. Because, he said in Matthew 10.10, 10, the workman is worthy of his meat. And in Luke 10, 7, the laborer is worthy of his hire. So Jesus, when he sent out people, he's like, you know what? The people that you are ministering to, they should be taking care of you. And so putting money in the offering plate is God's way to take care of his servants. Here's another reason we should put money in. Number two, bringing offerings to God's house is a way of helping the needy and the widows. Bringing offerings to God's house is a way of helping the needy and the widows. This is taught in the Old Testament. It's taught in the New Testament. We're going to focus on the New Testament. But I just gave you one verse in Deuteronomy 26, 12, there on your outline. When thou hast made an end of tithing, bringing in a tenth of all your tithes of thine increase the third year, which is the year of tithing, and hath and has given it unto the Levite, the stranger, 
the fatherless and the widows, that they may eat within thy gates and be filled. And so these, these tithes, a tenth of what they had, came to the temple, not just for the priests, not just for the Levites, but also to help out the widows. So it, was, it, it helped the fatherless and the widows. Letter A. Now the New Testament. We are to help the needy. We are to help the needy. Are God's people supposed to help those in need? Yes, they are. But it's interesting to me that the Bible seems to emphasize helping fellow believers. Uh, and here's where I say that. Look at, look at the verses. Fellow Christians and not necessarily everyone. And here's why I say that. James 2, 15, 16. Again, on your outline there. If a brother or sister be naked. They're not talking about a physical, literal brother. They're talking about if a fellow believer uh, be naked, in other words, they're short of clothing and destitute of daily food. And one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what do they profit? We are supposed to take care of one another. Believers, look at 1 John 3, 16 and 18. Again, on your outline, save you some time looking these up. But again, the emphasis is on believers. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassions from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed or in truth. And so uh, there is a, a, a teaching, there is an emphasis in the New Testament that we are supposed to give to the needy, but it seems to be pushed to the needy within the household of God. Do we do that? As a church, do we help out those in need? We do. Some of you know, most of you know, uh, but we have what's called the Deacon's Fund. And the Deacon's Fund is a separate account uh, that is offerings come in, and we, we often don't do that. Uh, but during the Lord's Supper, the first Sunday of the week, we put out a little basket, and those offerings come in. They go in the Deacon's Fund, and they are used for uh, helping people that find themselves in financial difficulty. We've given people gas, put gas in their cars, we brought groceries, uh, we've taken care of some medical things, we've uh, helped out some people that uh, had suffered loss in a fire. And so this, this fund is to help follow this command of taking care of those people that have needs. But, we can't help everybody all the time with every need they think they have. Uh, I remember, and I'm certainly not going to bring up names, but we had someone who desired that we did something for them, and uh, the deacons and I quickly agreed that was not a need. Uh, it was in that person's mind, uh, but we, but no, that's that's was not uh, a need. Just to set the record, that person is not here and hasn't been for a long time, so just kind of scratch that from your, you know, I could, I could just see that, I'm not calling you Judas, but you know what Judas said, is it, or all the disciples, is it I, is it I, is it I, it's not you, okay? Um, so the point is, we can't help everybody. Uh, it takes discernment from the Lord. Uh, it, it, you know, it takes wisdom and we, we count on God's direction and help in that. Um, same thing with help, helping adult children. Uh, sometimes we can get in the way of God working in their lives and maybe bail them out. And so we need discernment uh, with that. And that's, uh, that's free, no extra charge for that. But, uh, and then, you know, all that tugs at your heartstring. You want to but sometimes, you know, God's working in their life, and we can 
hinder that process. And so we're to help fellow believers in time of need. Uh, letter B, Paul took a collection for the poor. Paul took a collection for the poor. We're in 1 Corinthians 9, turn to chapter 16. So again, of course, go back to your Bible, a couple pages, 851 if you're using a pew Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse number 1. So Paul is writing to it, the church in Corinth, and he says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. I have told other churches to gather up an offering for saints, and Corinthians, I want you to do the same thing. What are the saints? The saints are obviously not dead people uh, that have been proclaimed a saint uh, by a group of people or a church. They are not dead people because dead people don't need money. Saints are God's, how, how God led Paul to refer to believers. Uh, believers in Christ are called saints. They are born again. Boy, uh, each one of us, if we are a child of God, we are a saint. That's what God uh, calls us. And the saints, verse number three, were from Jerusalem. When I come, end of verse three, uh, them will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. So why was Paul encouraging the Corinthians and encouraging all these other churches, pretty much everywhere he went, you need to take up an offering for these saints in Jerusalem? Uh, why were they poor? Why were they getting special treatment? One possible reason is, I gave you some verses in Acts chapter 11. One possible reason, there was a famine in the land. Uh, Acts chapter 11, verse number 27 through 30. Uh, and in these days came prophets from Jerusalem. So there were prophets from Jerusalem. They went to the city of Antioch, and there stood up one of them named Agabus, and signified by the Spirit that there should be great dearth. There was a famine coming throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. So this prophet gets up and says, there's going to be a drought, a famine. There's going to be a shortage of food. We need to take up an offering and bring it to these people who are going to be most affected. Uh, verse 29 in those verses I gave you, Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. Uh, of course, Judea is the region. Jerusalem is a city within Judea. Uh, and they did that. Uh, they gathered up this offering. They gave it to Paul, Barnabas and Saul. And so there was this drought, and maybe that's why they, they needed to take money up for them. Another reason... Uh, may have been persecution. Uh, Acts 8 verse 1 says, and at, their t and at the time there was great persecution against the church was at, which was at Jerusalem. So the church in Jerusalem was being persecuted. Sometimes that persecution involves a loss of job and a lot loss of income. America, do not be surprised if that happens. Uh, they, there's an effort to shut down certain Christian businesses and certain things, and it is a very slow, but it seems to be a very persistent process. It happened then, it could happen in the future. Persecution is, think about it, if persecution is against Christians, then things that hurt Christians are what they do. And there was loss of job. And there's a third reason that I thought was kind of interesting and um, I think weird sometimes, maybe. Don't say amen. But um, it, it, it was just an intriguing thought because, uh, and I didn't come up with it. I'll, I'll, I'll give credit to where credit's due. Dr. Bob. I have no idea who his last name was, okay? So Dr. Bob uh, reminds us that when the early church started, Acts chapter 2, was the day of Pentecost. There were people from all over, right, that had come to Jerusalem, Jews from all over that came to Jerusalem. They heard the gospel. They got saved. They didn't go home right away. 
they stayed in Jerusalem. And it's possible they needed to be taught. They wanted to be taught. It is possible uh, they stayed up to a year. So imagine, they are in the city of Jerusalem. And you remember it happened, right? They sold land. The people sold land. That's why Ananias and Sapphira is familiar. Um, they sold land to help take care of the needs of all these people that were in town. What an incredible sacrifice. Well, guess what? They get persecuted. They go home. They start working. They get involved in churches at home. And now it seems they have the opportunity to contribute to an offering that's going to go back and possibly benefit the very people who helped them in the first place. I thought that was pretty neat. I thought that was an interesting Thing, But money was given to the church, it was collected by Paul, so that he could give to God's people that had needs in a different location. Uh, letter C. We're almost done. Letter C. The churches care for widows. The churches care for widows. Go back towards the front of the Bible a little bit, to the book of Acts. Book of Acts. If you're using Pew Bible, it's page 805. 805, Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. The Bible actually has a lot to say, more than I can give you as far as the care of widows. The church's care for widows. So we're just going to look at this one. Uh, Acts chapter 6, verse 1. And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, I want to just park there. A disciple is a follower of Christ. There were the original 12, and then one was replaced. But disciples are learners and followers of Christ. They're growing. The church is growing. 3,000 got saved at Pentecost. In those days when the numbers of disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians, that's Greeks, and non-Jews, against the Hebrews, who were the Jews. Why were they complaining? Because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. The widows were being provided, the widows of both Jewish background and non-Jewish background, the widows were being provided food by the church. And there was a disagreement of, uh, it seems like uh, certain ones are not being treated fairly. So then verse number two, the 12 called the multitude of the disciples unto them. It's not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve the tables. They said, the, the leaders said, our priority is teaching God's word. We want you to pick out people to run this, to take care of the physical needs. Church is told how to go about, by the way, these are what we call the first deacons. Uh, they are were the helpers of the preachers, and they took care of the physical needs, and they're told how to do that, select out men, full of the Holy Ghost, and they so they assisted those who taught the Word so that they could keep on teaching the Word, doing the physical things, uh, the, the administrative, Verse number four, we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So money is not mentioned, but it's pretty safe to say money had to come into the church to take care of these widows. Do any churches do that now? Um, I don't say that I know of any, but... The possible and hopeful reason is this. Widows are supposed to be taken care of by their families. They are supposed to be taken care of by their families. First, if they have no family, then the church takes care of them. Does God expect us to take care of elderly parents? He does. Look at the verses I have for you on 1 Timothy 5. They're on your outline. 1 Timothy 5. But if any widow 
have children or nephews, uh, that word is used one time in the New Testament, probably is, leans more towards grandchildren. If any widow has, grand, has children or grandchildren, let them, the children or grandchildren, learn first to show piety at home and to requite or to repay their parents. In other words, they should be taking care of their parents. This is good and acceptable. 1 Timothy 5.16, if any man or woman that believeth, if you are a believer and you have a widow connected to your family, let them, the believer, take care of them, relieve them, and let not the church be charged that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. And so it's possible, uh, it's not a common church uh, done operation or ministry because there's very few people that meet, uh, that, uh, meet that category. So our time is done and maybe plus. Um, time for some application. That sometimes, uh, some sermons are harder to bring to a conclusion than, than most. And it might be uh, talking about a lot of stuff. Tabernacle, temple, offerings, tithe, paying the pastor, widows, uh, taking care of your elderly parents. So that's a lot to try together. But there's one common denominator. They all take money, right? They all they all take money. Uh, none of us has an endless supply that I know of. If you do, come meet me after. I'd have to get you money. Um, since none of us have an endless supply, each one of us must make choices regarding finances, right? We must make choices. So here's some questions we should ask ourselves. Do you want to know what God says about how to use what he has given you? If you want to know, then these kind of messages won't bother you. Uh, you'll want to hear, you want to study, more importantly, you want to study it out on your own. What does God say? How does this apply to me? Study the Bible for yourself. So. Just knowing what the Bible says is not the same as doing, right? Do you want to do what God says? Well, in order to do what God says, you have to be honest about how you use your money. And you have to evaluate. And you have to be willing to make changes uh, to follow what God says. Uh, but I want to end with this. Money decisions are not the most important decisions in life. The most important decision in life is what will you do with Jesus? What will you do with Jesus? That's the main thing. I've started with, by telling you this message is hopefully to a group of believers that love God and want to obey God and want to do what God says. But I know that may not be the case in every single instance. And so I uh, just know that... The most important thing is what will you do with Jesus? Why is that the most important thing? Because what we do with Jesus determines where we're going to spend eternity. Your money doesn't determine where you spend eternity. What you do with Jesus determines where you spend eternity. And at first I refer to often for John 5, 12, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. And so do you have Jesus? Not do you know about him, so what? Uh, do you have Jesus? Is he yours? How do you get Jesus? You receive him. You receive him by faith. In repentance and humility, understanding you need to be forgiven, and then calling upon him and believing he saves you when the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Have you done that? Father, again, we, we thank you for your word. We uh, thank you for the practicality of it. Uh, Lord, we, we talked before that the Bible has uh, 2,000 plus verses about money. And so it is obviously uh, something that you want us to know about. And Lord, not just to know about in a informational kind of way, but you want us to uh, follow what your word says about what you allow us to have. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would really create that mindset in us, that what we have is not ours, uh, it is from you, and we should want to know how you want us to use that which is from you. 
And so give us a, a sensitivity and a humility about that. Uh, Lord, I thank you that your word uh, says that you know those that are yours. Uh, Lord, I pray that if there's any here that are trusting in self-effort, uh, trusting in being good, trusting in sprinkling or as a baby, or even baptism as an adult, if they're counting on anything other than Christ's death on the cross, uh, I pray that they would see uh, that Jesus is the only way. No one comes to the Father but by Him, that they need to have Christ. And so work in their heart in that regard. And again, Lord, we just uh, thank you for uh, your word and just pray that uh, we respond the way you desire. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand, take your... Uh, hymnal 647, I'll go where you want me to go, Art and Don and Brenda are going to come, 647, please stand if you are able to, yeah. time at invitation, if